That's good enough. Okay, now it's time to start the indexing process. Okay, so we've got to mount an indexing wheel. That has to go behind the chuck. How much time do I have? 35 minutes, okay. Okay, indexing. So I have this index wheel. Uh, this is uh, just a plastic disc that had all these little holes in it here and you're supposed to have little pins that go through it. Uh, I don't use that. All I do is I'm using this basically as a round plastic disc. I print these index wheels out using that software program, the Graph Paper Maker. I have this one that's printed out in 72 segments. It's actually 144 if you count all the little ones. So 144 divided by 3 is 48. If you remember, I need 48 segments for this little plate, so I have them marked off for that little dark line every third one. That'll give me 48 segments. So that goes on first. Then I like to use a spindle extender so that I could do the front and the back of the platter at the same time and have a little more room to get behind it. You'll see when I do it why I do this. You could do it without that. You really can. But this does make it easier. And I have a piece of garbage wood. What do you call that? Um, Not what do you call that? Stuff that junk. Uh, melamine or melamine? melamine yes, yeah, stuff they make cheap cabinets out. That sits on there. Then I have. This is for indexing. So this depends on your lathe. So I have a Powermatic. So mine, this thing here would be level with the very center of my lathe, which is 10 and a quarter inches on a Powermatic. For this, it's eight inches, so I had to make a new one, and that's what I use for indexing. So I'm gonna index it to the marks one at a time. So what I do is I, you could put little magnets in this and just have it magnetically stick to the lathe. But since I just made this just for today, it doesn't have magnets in it, so I just use these little C clamps <coughs> and I just clamp it onto the bed of the lathe. Except, of course, the bottom of this thing is not flat, so it doesn't want to stay there, but that's good. Okay. Then this thing, I would clamp that to the lathe as well. I also have a little thing that goes through the hole and it has a little clamp that I can clamp it onto, onto the bed. But I wasn't sure if that clamp was gonna work on this jet lathe, so I didn't bring that and I just brought another C-clamp just to hold this so it doesn't flip flop over on me. But this doesn't seem to be working very well here because I guess the bottom of this maybe try a little further out here. No, it'll, it'll keep it from falling off. That's it's not really important. Then I have this pencil jig. It's just a stick of wood with another stick of wood coming out at a right angle. It's nothing fancy about this. This was an off cut from a platter, from a corner of a platter. And this is just a piece of something I had laying around. I drilled a hole here so that when this is sitting on top of this, this hole here is 10 and a quarter inches for my Powermatic. This is a Jet 1642, so the center of the lathe is eight inches. So I drilled another hole in here so that I would put my pencil at the center, which is eight inches. So that hole there I could use for a Jet 1642. So this is one jig I could use on multiple lathes. I also have another hole there because I wasn't sure if the center height was eight or eight and a quarter. So I had two holes just in case. Okay, so what I do is, my little, here it is. I have this little clamp here and I clamp this to each mark, lining up the mark with the top of this little white piece of plastic there. Then I take this and I draw a line here Draw a line on the back side. 
just like that. Then I go down to the next one and line it up with the top and I draw a line and I draw a line and I bring it all the way around the rim. Come down to the next one. You can't go all the way across this way. That's a good read. Everybody asks me that question because they all think they're smart, smart wise guys. There's a reason you can't do that. First of all, is I can't do it on the back. I'd have to come around here to get the back side. But it would only work if you have an even number of lines. If you have an odd number of lines, it doesn't work. In some patterns, you have an odd number of lines. So that's why I've just gotten into the habit of doing it like this. I don't go all the way to the very center because I generally don't burn all the way into the center because the lines get so close together in there you couldn't tell one line from the other. So I usually stop a few beads from the center. I'm not going to do this whole thing because it would take forever. But you see basically how you do this. Just moving one thing at a time. Drawing a line. Drawing a line. Okay? And when I'm finished then it's ready for me to start burning the segments over the beads. Okay, so through the magic of television, we have one here that is all indexed. I'll put it here for you, wherever you want. And I've also taken off the tenon and I added a few more beads when I did that. So when I, when I have to take this off to remove the tenon, I'll just stick it back on my chuck. I'll stick a mouse pad in here put it up against the chuck, bring the tail stock in, and I will turn away most of the tenon and finish up this back, adding however many beads I need to satisfy this pattern, which is 17 beads. Okay. Then after I finish the beading, I leave a little spot, flat spot in the middle where I sign it. Okay. If I'm doing larger platters, I'll get a little fancier in the back sometimes, and I might put a couple of beads in there and then just leave myself a little ring to sign it there. Okay? All right, so we're all done with what we're going to do on the lathe here. I'll take all this stuff away. Actually, we'll leave this here. And then we can take this away, take this away, go this away and that away. do is we could pass this one around so you can all see what it looks like. If I can pick it out of there. Oh, that's tightened. That's loosened up. So you forget, you get the Vic marks go one way, the supernovas go the other way. Pass that around. Okay, so now time to do some of the burning. So let me talk about the burning a little bit, the equipment. So there are many different pyrography machines out on the market. This one is made by Optima. Uh, there's a razor tip, there's Colwood, um, Detail Master, or Burn Master, and probably a bunch of other ones. They all do the same thing. They're a DC transformer inside. They take 110 AC, they make 12 volts DC, just like a car battery charger. And some, some way you plug a uh, pyrography pen into it and it heats the pen up. So they all do the same thing. They all, some of them claim that, you know, we have more wattage than the other guy. But if you understand anything about electricity, none of that really matters because it depends on how much current your pen is going to draw. And wattage is volts times current. Um, they all can provide enough current to heat up any of the pyrography pens that we use today. The only difference you got to worry, worry about is how you connect the pen. This one requires an RCA plug. Some of them use what's called the phono plug, which would be this guy. These pens that I use are made by Detail Master, and they all come with the phono plug. So I have an adapter that takes the phono plug and connects it to my RCA plug. One of these days, I'll be ambitious enough. I'll cut this off and then just get myself some RCA plugs at Radio Shack or something, solder them in there, and I won't need this adapter anymore. Yeah, while they're, while they're still around, yes. This is the uh, pen that I use to burn over the beads. Uh, so again, this is on the handouts that I gave you. Um, it's made by Detail Master. These are called fish scaling pens. 
and they come in a variety of sizes. This is the 1 8 it's the, they call that the number 9C. Um, I use 9C for 1 8 9D is 3 16 and the 9E is 1 quarter an inch. Those are the three pens that I have that I do use. The 1 8 of course, gets used 99% of the time because all my Bs are 1 8 that you can buy the entire pen like that. I'm sorry, you trying to take a picture? You can buy the entire pen. These are excellent pens. They're vented, so the heat comes up through the pen and comes out here, and you don't feel any heat in your fingers while you're working. Or you can just buy the tip if you have one of those types of pens that you can use replaceable tips. So I have here one of those pens that you can screw the tip into, and you can buy just this, screw it into there, this will cost you about $18. Once you have the pen, then you could just buy tips, um, where this will cost you $32. I like these better because they're more comfortable. You can see how fat that is, and if you're going to be working with this thing for hours and hours at a time, this is not comfortable. Also, I found that putting tips in and out, they are fragile, and I have broken a few of them, so I, I don't do that anymore. I've invested in these guys. Um, again, I have the 1 8 I have a second one in 1 8 because this one was starting to bend on me after using it for several years now. And then I have, this is the 3 16 You can see the difference between 1 8 and 3 16 or maybe that's the quarter, I'm not even sure. You can't change the tip. No, these are, are permanently soldered in there. And then I have yeah, this is the quarter inch one, which is even the biggest, okay? You don't really need the 3 16 in the quarter that much, okay? But sometimes for doing the outer bead, the outer, the rim piece, sometimes you need it there, depending on how you're treating the rim. So I'm going to talk about that for a minute before I actually do the burning. So in my early days, when I was doing the rim, I would just wrap the line around. I would take this line here, connect it to the same spot on the back and I would burn that, and that's where I would use the 3 16 or the quarter inch pen to do that. If the pen didn't fit, I'd have to use a burning skew to do that. Okay, usually the quarter inch pen fits. So you might have to use a combination, the 3 16 pen on the front of the bead, on the back of the bead, and then the quarter inch pen to get the top of the bead. So the first batch of pieces that I did all had the rim treatment like that. But that's not really the good way of doing it. That's the easy way. Okay. Once you start doing more and more of these, you'll see that. I'm coming. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. You'll see that there are better ways of doing the rim. This one is uh, what's called a herringbone. You got it there? Okay. I don't have it there yet. Um, this is done as a herringbone design. And this is done entirely with a skew burning tip. There's no, none of the, uh, the uh, beading or fish scaling uh, pens done with that. Very lengthy process. It takes about five burns to get all the way around from inside here all the way around to the halfway point. And then another five or so burns to get from there all the way around. And you gotta work very low heat so that you don't overburn. Um, just a very lengthy process. And then coloring in every other one. The rim of this thing could take you almost as long as doing one of the faces on it. That's a herringbone. Then there's also just what's called a spiral wrap, where you just go from one side all the way around to the other side. Did you lose it? Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay, so it's just a spiral wrap. Um, and again, this is done just with a skew, not with any of the fish scaling tips. So there's different ways of doing that. You have to figure out what's the right heat setting for your burner so that you can work somewhat quickly on these. It takes for this burner somewhere between seven and eight. And that sounds like a high number, but it's not for this pen. Seven or eight on a skew would leave black lines and overburn terribly, where for a skew, I would use a setting of three on this burner. But a, seven, a setting of about eight on this allows me to burn in a continuous manner, taking about a second, a second <coughs> and a half per bead. So once the pen is heated up, I just sit in a comfortable chair. I do this part in the shop um, only because I usually do all the coloring in my recliner chair with my feet up, lights over my shoulders, nice and comfortable. I'm afraid to do this in my recliner chair because it's leather. 
And if I drop this and burn a hole in the leather, I'll have to ask one of you to take me in. <laughs> so for that reason, I'll do this in the shop, sitting in a chair very similar to this. It's just starting on a line, picking a spot, hitting it, and just moving down. You see how long it takes to do each one. I try to stay on my marks. Doesn't have to be perfect. You can waver a little bit. Because you remember, this is supposed to look like it's woven baskets, and woven baskets are not perfect. Now these beads on this little platter here are imperfect. So there's, some of them have flat spots on the top, like if you look at this one right here, it's so flat on the top. So what happens is that when you burn it, the top of the bead doesn't get burned. And you can see right here and right here, there's a little white spot on the top. So I have to go back on that and sort of wiggle the burning tip on there a little bit, just so that I can get the whole piece burned. If you skip that, nobody ever going to know the difference. But you see how long it takes. It takes about a second, second and a half, to burn each one. If I lowered the setting on the burner, I would have to wait a little bit for it to recover in between each burn. And that would take me a lot longer than I wanted to take me. But this is a very time-consuming process. On this little platter, we're probably talking about four hours. On that large platter behind me, the very big one, you're probably talking about 15 hours of burning both sides. So I'm not going to do a lot of this. I'm just going to do a couple rows, just so you see how it's done. What got you into this? I don't know. I really don't know. I could tell you that when I was first learning to turn 15 years ago, I did see David Nittman do a demo once. It was a slideshow. It wasn't actually a turning demo, but he, he did a slideshow of how he did the process. And I said to myself, I would never in my right mind do that. But I didn't even know how to turn yet. I was like, you know, turning for six months or something like that. But for some, I don't know what it is. I just tried doing this once. I did a platter and, you know, it came out okay, but my color choices were poor. Um, and then I, see I was still working, I wasn't retired, and I said, I, I might do this again, but it takes too long, so I'll just put this on the side, and maybe someday I'll get back to it. And now I'm retired, I'm retired almost two years, and I kind of enjoy doing this, I don't know. I keep saying I won't do anymore, but I keep going back to them. Well, I have to tell you though, you don't, you're not just working on this. Since this is a process where you're only working on it a couple hours at a time, you're working on other things. I mean, I'm turning other things in the shop, you know, and this thing is sitting on my recliner chair, and every now and then I'll go sit down and do two hours worth of it. Um, but when I do it, I have no distractions. I don't have the TV on, no radio, nothing. Because uh, if you count wrong, and you color in that wrong square, like I told you, you got to get that scalpel out, it's awful annoying. Um, but that's how we do the beads, okay? We do front and back, and as I said before, we're probably looking at about three to four hours just to do burning these beads front and, front and back. To do the rim part, if I was going to do the rim where I'm just going to come around straight lines, I would use a combination of my fish scaling tools. But I've graduated from that. And now I do the spirals or I do herringbones. So in order to do that, you need a method. I'll stand for a minute here and get my pencil. You need a method of drawing lines from here all the way around to somewhere on here diagonally. So you need to be able to draw lines like this. And I'm just doing this freehand. That's not how I would do it. But you need to have these lines go all the way down into here. And it's impossible to freehand this come all the way around and then come from there all the way down into there over and over again and very close together I don't want these to be too far apart I really want this to look like a very tight weave it looks very very authentic it's very difficult so in order to do that you need to make something that will fit over the profile of this last bead and allow you to trace lines on it so what I have learned from Jim Atkins, the fellow in Missouri who I told you does this better than anyone, 
is he takes a moldable epoxy like JB Weld. <coughs> I can't do this now because this takes overnight. Um, he takes, you take about an eighth of an inch slice off of this. It's got the hardener in the middle and the resin part on the outside. And you just roll it around in your hands until it's all turned one color. And that's when it, everything is activated. Then you take a piece of saran wrap and roll the piece out first in your hands to make a string out of it, about a quarter of an inch diameter string, as long as you can get. It only needs to be that long. Put it on the saran wrap, fold the saran wrap over it, then go get a rolling pin or something round, big, you know, round pepper mill blank or something, and roll it out as if you were rolling out bread dough or something. And you roll it out until it's about a 32nd of an inch thick. Then you take it with the saran wrap still on it, and you wrap it around this, tucking it all the way into the valley, all the way into the valley, wrap it around, and then tape it on there. Let it dry overnight. And what that does is it makes you something that looks like this. This is one from a previous piece, probably won't fit on here, but this is what it would look like. So this is where it wrapped around in the rim, inside here. Then you just take it and take a knife or a small saw or however you want to do it and cut it at 45 degree, about. Do the same on the other side if you're going to do a herringbone. If you're just doing a spiral wrap, you only need one direction. If you're going to do the herringbone, it has to go both ways, so you do the same thing on the other side. Then you could take this, this again, it probably won't fit on here because this wasn't made for this platter, but if you take it, it would fit right on here like that. Then you could trace like that. And you could just keep sliding it, tracing like that, and just keep doing that over and over again. Okay, and that you would get lines that are all parallel to each other and they would look really good. Again, this piece doesn't fit this platter, so it doesn't fit, so I really can't do it correctly. Um, <coughs> you could also draw a line down the middle like that. So then you would only go halfway up. So you would go from here to the line, to the line, to the line. Then using the other angle on the other side, you go the opposite direction. So you go that way to the line, to the line. And again, I'm not doing this accurately, but that's how you would do a herringbone then. Okay? So every time you make a platter, you have to make one of these things out of epoxy. So that gets old too. So I have found other ways of doing it that's much quicker, but it's hit or miss. You can find anything, uh, a drinking straw that fits over it. You can cut the straw, you know, put a slice down it so the straw wraps around it. A small little piece of the straw, just that long, and cut the end of it at a 45 degree angle and that might work. A little piece of plastic tubing might work. If you take one of those uh, little plastic uh, Tupperware things that like all your lunch meats and stuff come in at the deli counter now, the lid of those things has a little U-shaped channel in it. That works pretty well, actually. So you just cut out that U-shaped channel and cut it at a 45 degree, and that's pretty flexible, too, and that works pretty well. So anything, basically, that allows you to fit over the profile of that out of bead so that you can trace lines, that's all you really need. But if you're just going to do this type of, of a rim treatment, then you can just burn that with any of the fish scaling tips and a skew, whatever combination you need to do that. Okay, and that's how you would burn all that. Okay? So enough about that. So now again through the magic of television, we have a piece that is completely burned. Now this is a piece I've been using to demo, so I've done a little bit of the coloring on the inside. <coughs> we'll need our pattern just to refer to. Don't need this right now. Okay, so I'm worried about pens. When I first started doing this, I was using Sharpie markers. You can get Sharpie markers in a zillion different colors, and they come in a pretty good selection of nib sizes. They're cheap, <coughs> but they work. The problem is their alcohol dies, and alcohol dies if you 
try to spray anything over the piece when you're done with it. The alcohol just bleeds all together and you make a mess out of it. Now, how do I know that happens? <laughs> so here's a piece I did with Sharpie markers. This side was not sprayed with anything. That's just the way it looked off the marker. This side I sprayed. I don't even remember what it was. It wasn't a shellac thing. and I made sure it wasn't alcohol. It was either lacquer or an acrylic spray. I don't remember. But all the red bled, and you can see how the red is bled all over the place and just smeared, and it just looks terrible. So this is basically 30, 40 hours in the firewood. But I carry it around just to show everybody that that's how you can mess one up. Okay. So that's how nice it looks before you do it. Again, not the right choice of colors because that red it would never be a Native American type of red. Okay, it's just too red. Um, but again, it was you know I did a good job on it. I just shouldn't have sprayed it. I gave up on Sharpies. I tried Prismacolors and other alcohol-based markers. And while they are they are a little bit more stable and they do have a great selection of colors and nib sizes as well. They are still alcohol and they are really, even though they say they're permanent, they are not light fast archival quality. Even though they might say they are, they really aren't. So I started looking around for something that would be perfectly suitable for whatever I might spray on it when I'm done with it. <coughs> and Cynthia Gibson told me about Faber-Castell makes India ink markers. So she told me all about them and I started using them and sure enough Cynthia being the great artist that she is was 100% right about these. I just want to get the right ones out. <coughs> they come in a billion different colors. Unfortunately though for the nib sizes we need to do this you have a choice of three colors. But it just happens to be the right three colors you need if you're going to do Native American stuff. These three colors that I have here. Sanguine is the reddish color. Sepia is the brownish color. And black when you're doing them black. So those are the three colors you can get them in. You only need two different tips. You need the brush tip, which is this one here. I'll hold it right over the white. Okay, so it's just a felt tip. It has no plastic or metal sleeve around it. So it's basically unguarded, so it's your steady hand that determines where the ink is going to go. And then they have this, what they call super fine tip, which has a metal sleeve around it. That is a very, very thin, fine tip, and that lets you get down into the valleys between the beads without getting ink on the bead next to it. So this tip is good for the very, very bottom part of the bead, and this tip is good for working the top or the larger part of the bead. These are light fast archival quality. They're excellent markers. They last forever and they're cheap. They're less than two bucks a piece if you get them from Dick Blick or any of the other large art supply places. I usually buy them 10 of each at a time. They last you quite a while. You'll never run out of ink, but you'll destroy the tip before you run out of ink. I have found by accident that these brush tip ones you get two tips for the price of one. When you have used this brush tip so much that it's no longer sharp and you can't get accuracy with it, you take a pair of tweezers and pull it out and reverse it and there's a fresh brush tip on the other side that's sitting inside the little reservoir in there. Okay, so you get a second tip for the price of one. That's not the case for these other ones, but for the brush tip ones, which are the ones you're really going to wear out the most, you get two tips for the price of one. You can wear it out quite a bit before it gets to the point where you can't use it anymore. Okay, so the coloring is basically done. You take your pattern and you start transferring the pattern to the piece. So if you remember what I said, if you commit yourself and start coloring in and make a mistake, you got to get the scalpel out and you got to start scraping it away. So I do have the scalpel here just so you can see what we're dealing with. This is an X-Acto knife. I thought I had the scalpel too. I think I put it somewhere else. Probably in here. Nope, I don't know what I did with it. Anyway, somewhere I have a scalpel. This is an exacto knife. This works too, even though a utility knife with a really sharp blade. The blade has got to be really, really sharp. So this blade, the way they come from the package, isn't even sharp enough. What I do is I go hone this on the Tormek before I use it for scraping wood. 
sounds like a lot of work, but it allows you to scrape the wood so fine that you could really do it without messing up the beads too much. So in order to avoid making the crucial mistakes where I've got to scrape away all the ink, what I have learned to do is taking the fine marker, the one with the tiny little dot tip, and marking off little dots, as you can see here, I mark the pattern off with these dots so that if I make a mistake, all I have to scrape away is the little dot. Now, you could do that with pencil, which makes it even easier. If you're doing a piece in black or you're doing a piece in the sepia color, use a pencil to make your dots because the ink will cover it. But if you're going to be using the reddish sanguine color, don't use the pencil, use the reddish pen because the pencil dot will show through the reddish color on the top. <coughs> Those actually, you can actually see if you look closely, you can see the little pencil dots. Okay, so if you really want to be safe, make your dots, if, as long as you're doing black or sepia, make your dots with a pencil. And then you could just erase. Okay, so what I do is I just look at the pattern and I figure out where do I got to go. So where do I go from here? I just got to go down a couple of spots. Three, uh, looking at there, I got to go down seven five, six, seven, and then I got to go in three, so I just make my dots, and then I got to go up five, two, three, four, five, then I got to go in this way, and then I got to come down uh, to there, okay, and then I got to go this way. So basically I'm just making the dots to match the pattern. Once I've cover the entire piece in dots. I basically will do everything in one color first. So this is going to be one color piece. It's all black. So I would just do all the dots for the, everything that needs to be done on this pattern. I would do everything in dots. Okay. If I was working two colors, I would do all the black dots or all the brown dots. I do all the coloring. Then I come back and I do the next color, which might be the sanguine. I make all the red dots and then do all that coloring. If it's three colors, I do the third color then. If you drag your hand over it, does it transfer the color? No. Nope. You'll see that when I do it. Um, this stuff soaks right into the wood. Um, it doesn't penetrate very, very deeply. It, the alcohol dyes penetrate, uh, penetrate a lot deeper. Uh, these are pigmented, so they, um, they <coughs> sort of kind of lay on the top of the wood, but they do penetrate as well, um, which makes the scraping off easier. Also, I found if you scrape it off right after you make the mistake, it comes off much easier than if you wait five minutes or if you realize you made the mistake ten minutes later or two days later. <clears throat> okay, so again, now I'm in my recliner chair. I got my feet up. I have a light over each shoulder because I have old eyes. And I wear bifocals. But I put a pair, of, this sounds stupid now, but I pair reading glasses over the bifocals. So I have magnification with range so I could still move the piece around. My wife thinks I'm a freak when I do that, but so be it. I make sure I'm comfortable. I make sure I have the pattern laying right next to me and I have everything I need. My scalpel is right on the arm of the chair there. So I'm all set to go. My pens are laid out and I get comfortable. And then I just start working the tops of the beads, finding a comfortable position. And I just work the tops working right up to the burn line, trying not to go over it. And when you got a whole bunch in a row, it's easy. You just, you know, don't have to worry about going over the burn lines. It's only until you get to the very end here where you got to be careful. And then I'd have to go down here, all the way to there, there, there. This whole batch here has to get done. So I would just go like that. And I'm basically just doing the top part of the bead here. And I get as close to the burn line as I dare go. I used to not go this close, but now I've done this enough that I've gotten the confidence. If you don't have patience, or if you, do, if you have shaky hands, then find another project. <laughs> okay, once I've done that, I can come back here and I can get a little closer down in the bead because the more you do with this pen, the faster it goes with the other one. Because the other one is making such a fine line, you don't really want to have to cover much real estate with the super fine tip. This is the brush tip. This is the brush tip, right. 
but you got to be careful because if you hit an adjacent bead or someplace you don't want ink, this is going to leave ink on an adjacent bead. So like if I was doing this one right here and I accidentally touched that one there, I would leave ink on it and I don't want that to happen. Okay, so you got to be really careful <coughs> where you're going with these things. Okay, I'm up to here. Okay, then I would switch, I mean I would do all of, a lot of this with the brush tip first. I wouldn't just keep going back and forth. But I have to work within my time constraints here. Then with the brush, with the super fine tip, I just work my way down into the beads. Trying to get all the way down as far as I can in there. Getting everything done all the way to the bottom of it. And what I'm very careful is that I square off the corners of each one of these things. So everything looks nice and square and the entire segment is done. And then I will get the other side of it as well. So this is the ones I'm doing right here. Something like that. Can't really have a beer. A what? No, no, no. There's no. Uh, you can't imbibe on anything when you're doing this. You, you can't watch TV. I'm serious. You can't. You really can't get distracted. So you really have to want to do this. And I know this is not for everyone, but everybody likes to know how it's done. So you get to see how it's done. Okay. So I'll just finish up this little row here. It's kind of hard sometimes to work on the concave shapes, like the inside of the dish, because there's no place to put your hand. On a large platter, it's easier. But on these little platters like this, it's kind of hard to sometimes get the pen all the way into where you want it to be. And I just make sure that I got the whole bead. There's no white spots. I try to get sure everything is squared off, like everything crisp. And that's basically how I do it. Once I finished the entire color on this piece, if this was one color, then obviously I'd have the whole side done. Then what I do is, again, with real good light and real good magnification, I would look for any spots where I might have gone over the line. And I'll take my scalpel and just clean that up a little bit. <coughs> Only because you're putting all this work into the piece, why have any imperfections in it? If you're going to be putting 40, 50 hours into it, take another hour and clean up any little spots you might have gone over the line. And, and inadvertently, you always do. Um, I really like these pens. I've been using them for a couple of years now. I have tried other pens as well. And I'll talk about these very briefly. Because these are good pens, but I'm just not quite sure I really like them that much. These are made uh, by a company called Sakura. Um, these are uh, paint, basically, in them. Um, they're called Pigma Microns and they come in a good variety of tip sizes, some of them extremely, extremely small. So you start out with a brush tip, you know, so that's very similar to the brush tip that I was just using. And I'll lay them out side by side so that you could see them. Then there's this .01, there's a .05 which will go next to that, and then a .05 which will go in there. So these are the four different tip sizes you could use on these. This one here would really get down tight into a valley. I mean, they're really, really good to get down in there. If nothing else will get in there, these will. But these tips are very fragile. They're so thin, they're very fragile. And since we're dealing with wood and sometimes not, it's not a perfectly smooth surface, I mean, if there's any little bit of coarseness to it, it wears the tip away or snaps them off. They also like to be held vertically because it's a sort of a thicker pigment paint in there. If you're holding them like this, they don't seem to work very well. You've got to hold them sort of down. So I, I kind of don't like them for that, but I do use them occasionally. Um, when nothing else will get down into a valley there, if I, you know, got something that my regular uh, Indie ink pen isn't getting quite down in there, especially on the inside of a platter, um, I'll go to these guys instead. Um, they don't come in the best colors. They come more in primary colors. They don't come in these 
typical Native American type colors. So the black ones are the only ones that are really good to me. Uh, they come in blues and reds and greens and yellows and things like that. Um, no sepias, you know, no sanguines. But um, if you do it just black, these are good to have on hand just for the situation where you really got to get into something that you can't get down deep in there with the regular India ink pens. The last thing I'll say is when I'm all done with the piece and it's finished and I like what I've done, I take it out in the backyard and I put it down on top of something and I spray it with the Krylon matte finish spray. If you've ever used this stuff, you know it dries in a heartbeat. You just spray it on and you sneeze and you look back and it's dry. So you could put on three, four quick coats and usually two minutes flat. Then I'll turn it over and I'll do the same thing on the other side and I call it a day. And then the piece is done. I have tried using Minwax Antique Oil over a piece, usually on some of my vessels. Uh, after I do the uh, dyeing, I'll put a coat of Minwax Antique Oil, one coat. Um, that looks okay, but it does darken the wood a little bit. Um, and sometimes that may not be desirable depending on what kind of wood it is and how it soaks up oil. Um, so I found acrylic spray is the best thing just as to use as a fixative. And that's about all I have. Anybody have any questions? I can see how you do it on a platter, but when you look, talk about the hollow forms that have a different shape like that, you still put the same lines around it like you were the with like the beating tool. Yeah, so when this thing is on the lathe, I'm beating this. This has one eighth inch beads all around it. And when I index it, these lines go all the way, same way. Okay, because I've seen that in angle, I just put out No, these lines are all straight. This pattern is a spiral, you know, which, which oh, may so be... what you colored into it makes it look like the yes. spiral. Yes, okay. but these lines are all perfectly segmented just the way, done with the indexing wheel, sitting here. And I'm drawing lines from here to here, <coughs> here to here. What I do when these lines are really close together like these, I mean these are very small segments, I index every other line. So rather than, this has probably uh, got 144 or 190 segments or something like that. So rather than index every one of those lines, it just takes too long, I do every other one. And then I burn those. Then with the burning pen, I split them down the middle by eye and just burn the second, you know, so I'm basically cutting them in half. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Use that same pencil jig to do that. Sure, you can. I do use the exact same thing. Pencil jig. Here's my pencil jig. So I'm, I'm going, you know, I have my piece of wood down here, and I'm just going here, and I'm running down the hollow form. With it. Okay, just like that. I move it, and I go down the hollow form. And I move it, and I go down the form again. Exact same way. And you can, you know, if the pencil needs to be pushed out more, you can push it out more, or you can pull it in a little bit, you know, if that needs to be done. It's just in a tight hole, that's all it is. Anything else? When you paint, do you paint all the way down into the bone mark? I try to. I try to get way, way down into the valley. If you look closely at what I did here, you, you can see, if you could zoom in on that. These are the ones that I just did. And you can see I try to get way, way down in there. Okay? You don't avoid getting down into that. No, you want it. You want to try to get all the way down. I mean, you burned in there, um, so you've already darkened it. Now this one looks like it hasn't. I didn't burn the lines between these uh, these beads. Um, I didn't do it on that side either. Um, so I mean, you would have already burned in there. So, but the the cut ones you're not coloring in wouldn't have a burn line in there. So that's why you want to burn all these. Okay. Just willy-nilly. When I did this one, I just made them all roughly an eighth of an inch, and I just tried to make sure it came out to an even number, because I was going to color them in, so I need black, white, black, white, black, white. So I didn't want to end up with two blacks or two whites. So it tick came out, I was wrong, so I found one somewhere that was a little bigger than the others, and I split it, <laughs> so I could have one more segment out of it. Okay. Anything else? Thank you.